Hey everybody, it's your girl Shreebad. How you doing? I hope everybody's fine on this given night. It is time to talk to you about Yana Yoga. And not only will I talk to you about Yana Yoga, I will also talk to you about Tantra. Finally, right? And I will also talk about how the other yoga breakdowns and chakras correlate to yana yoga. And in a sense, tantra. All right. I'm going to read a lot to you. So I hope my voice uh, translates in a good way. Read a lot. Um, and I'm also going to expound on a lot of things while still trying my best to keep you on the surface of what is what, okay? With that being said, Please be reminded that I'm not here to teach you anything. I'm going to try not to curse. It's going to be hard. <laughs> um, I'm just here to give you some perspective, okay? Share my perspective, maybe expand your perspective, not so much change your mind, or, you know, just... A happy suggestion, maybe. Or just a better basic understanding of what you think you know when it comes to certain things. I want to begin with a recent conversation between a Shiva and a Shakti. As you guys know, I like to tell my stories chronologically, so... I will jump back and forth between past and present. If I'm not clear, please let me know. Thank you in advance for listening, liking, down liking, sharing, subscribing, whatever it is you do best. I appreciate it. So this conversation between a Shiva and a Shakti, it's like a sutra. Shiva says, subdue your passions. Shakti says, are your passions different than your emotions or are they the same? Shiva responds, ah, sometimes they tend to clash. The Shakti was me, and the Shiva was my boyfriend. That was based on a larger conversation we were having in regards to uh, drama and why people start drama and why people get so emotional and why certain people are called emotional and others are not, and X, Y, Z. <clears throat> But there's a reason why I brought that up and I had to write it down because right after we had that exchange, I realized, wow, this is Tantra. All right, so let's jump back a little bit. Keep that to the side for a moment, all right? We might get back to that. That's just really an example to come back to. I got a lot of videos on my YouTube channel. I guess I talk a lot. I try to keep it under a certain amount of time. This one might go over an hour. We'll see. And when I first came on YouTube, and I really started getting into Master Fundi Fee, one of the first things that she said was, 
Don't learn anything new right now. Go ahead back to what you already know and relearn that. That's the gist of it. That's what I got out of it, right? So the first book that I decided to open up was called the Sri Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, The Ascent, right? The book on Tantra. And as I started reading that book, I realized I really can't explain to you guys what Tantra is until I go through these yoga breakdowns. Because I know Tantra by way of yoga. Okay? <clears throat> now, in that process of me doing these yoga breakdowns, I had to put this book down up until today when I decided to talk about Yana yoga. Now, in my previous um, uploads, I talked about a book in regards to Yana yoga. Um, it's called I Am That. I do not have that book on me. I actually, excuse me, let someone hold it and they kept it. So that's either here nor there. That's, that's what it is. Sorry, I got something to drink some water. So I sat and I was like, well, what other book can I get that would help me better to explain what I want to explain about Yana Yoga? <clears throat> And I remembered that I had a book, a brown book, a big book, about 500 pages of this book. The book is called The Book of Secrets by Osho. All right. So I will be reading to you from that book, as well as the first book, the Sri Vigyana Bhairava Tantra. Okay. I also want to put that to the side for a moment because that's going to get into Tantra. That's where I got to read. That's what I got to read out of. Okay. Let's get into the chakras and the yoga breakdowns for a moment. There are seven main Chakras in your astral body. Some yogis and pandits believe that there are 12, up to 12. There are three main nadis in the astral body, but there have been known or assumed to be up to 21,000 nadis in your astral body. Remember, these are not physical things in your body. Um, these are causal and astral. They go beyond the physical plane. If you open someone up, you will not find nadis. You will not find chakras. Um, the closest relation or correlation to nadis would be the nervous system, but it's still not that kind of a thing. Um, nadis would be like a nervous system to your... Kundalini, that type of energy. But it does not exactly function the same. Not exactly. So even though there are seven chakra, chakras and there are six different types of yoga, I'm going to put them together for you, okay? Okay. So the six different types of yoga are karma yoga, hatha yoga, bhakti yoga, ya, ya, japa yoga, yana yoga, raja yoga. Okay? And even though in my yoga breakdown, I did hatha yoga first, hatha yoga does not correlate to the root chakra. Okay. 
Hatha yoga correlates to the second and third chakra. Now, let's think. The root chakra deals with your basic instincts, your survival instincts. That is truly where your fight, flight, or fright comes from. Um, it is where you should be grounding yourself. Um, and what you ground yourself in is important. So the best type of yoga for your root chakra would be karma yoga, selfless service, because that reminds your and purifies your root chakra in a way that your basic survival instinct as a human being is to protect the earth and the inhabitants of that earth. And in order for you to, to, to do that, you have to respect the earth and respect your fellow man by helping an old lady across the street or helping to plant a garden, right? Some sort of service and not a paid service, a service from your heart or from that place that is beyond the heart, that is below the heart, that is connected to the earth, okay? As you sit in your seat to meditate, it is your root chakra that touches that earth because you also come from that place that is where you get a lot of your soma and your life. So it's important to know how to properly treat yourself, right? As a human as a, and as a mammal. The second and third chakras, the Swadhisthana and the Manipura, really correlate to Hatha Yoga. Most Hatha Yoga techniques, especially the seated positions, are meant to make men celibate, okay? To promote celibacy, especially the sannyas, the monks, right? Because I may have mentioned before that men need to, instead of constantly putting their sexual energy out. They actually need to keep that sexual energy in so that it can transform into the energies that can benefit the other chakras or the higher levels of your consciousness, okay? The root chakra is where the kundalini sits. And when it starts to stir, you want that root chakra to be pure so that it can ascend properly to the second chakra. Most human beings do not have control over their sex. All of these chakras are different aspects of your ego, okay? And everybody has heard about that word, the ego, right? We'll get to that. Hatha yoga allows you to be comfortable in your body. The second chakra is about sex, but not just the sex that you have between a man and a woman. It can also be the sex that is your gender, male, female, other, being comfortable in that type of skin to allow your creativity to flourish, not only for the benefit of yourself, but inadvertently for the benefit of mankind. You see, I have not gone to the universe just yet. Now, as far as your third chakra is concerned, I have definitely spoken about that, especially in the negative aspects of this chakra, which is rage and anger and things of such sort, which is beyond the root chakra, right? That's when the ego's really in there. Because remember, the root chakra is fight, 
flight, or fright. It deals with fear. The basis of all the sins and all the causes of death, because remember, we're living in an illusion. This is Maya. We're still dealing with Maya here. We have not crossed over to anything. Once you purify that Manipura chakra, then you start getting into the higher levels beyond the physical or beyond the earth plane, right? You start ascending up towards the universe, towards the divine planes, towards the ethers. And Hatha Yoga helps you to purify that aspects of you. You see the second chakra is all about your passions. And the third chakra is about your emotions. In the second and third chakras, you begin to realize that the ego is not something that you can or should control. What you can and should control are your attachments to your passions or your attachments to your emotions, which is the way your passions communicate. Right? You're so passionate about something. So you might get angry when somebody challenges that passion or challenges what gives you that passion in the first place. What gives you that creative spark to do whatever positive or negative thing that you do, that motivation that you have comes from that second chakra. And the third Chakra is how you deal with that when things don't go your way. How you transform that fire. Do you make that fire more fire or do you make that fire like blue fire where it doesn't take a lot of it to burn you? And it's actually hotter than the internal, you know, reddish oranges flame that you always see. Now we get to the fourth chakra, your Anahata chakra. That's where the Bhakti Yoga comes in because the Anahata chakra deals with your Hidraya, your heart. So now through an object, an external object that's still connected to you, you begin to learn how to purify your heart. Purify the ego that is in your heart. not control it, maybe restrain it a little bit. These are different aspects of the ego, how the ego permeates through your whole psyche, your ahamkara. You need to understand how to ascend by silencing this ego a little bit more. When you do karma yoga, it affects the bhakti yoga. When you do hatha yoga, it makes it easier for you to receive the bhakti yoga, the benefits of that love and devotion to that thing, whether it's external or internal, it don't matter. It's an object. Now we get to the fifth chakra, the Vishuddha chakra, the throat chakra. And we already understand that Japa yoga definitely has to deal with the throat chakra. Because now that your heart is open and you're ready to receive the universe, you have to learn how to talk to the universe, right? You have to learn how to use your speech to not only help you ascend higher, but for the universe to truly help you up. Mauna 
comes into play because at some point in time, not only do you have to learn how to talk to the universe, you need to learn how to listen when it responds. Because remember, the universe don't always talk. The universe shows you. You have to be able to use your eyes to see it. You have to restrain the ego in your mouth and then learn how to listen with your ears by the practice of mauna, the link between japa yoga and yana yoga, which is your third eye chakra, the ajna chakra. How can you open your eye if it's still clouded by that ego because you can't speak to the universe properly? You definitely not hearing the universe properly and you did not open your heart to properly feel what the universe is trying to show you. It's hard. And the ego gets up in there and then you can turn it into an asura real quick. Because that snake energy is all over the place. By your speech, you can turn into a snake. By your passions, you can turn into a snake. Someone can manipulate your energy and take it from you. And not only take it from you, but give you back their bullshit energy. And you don't even know. Because when you purify all these things, it creates a, a boundary. Let's call it that. A protection of sorts. You see, I'm not trying to stand alone anymore. I'm trying to stand with the universe. Whatever that looks like as far as righteousness and true love, and true compassion, and true consciousness, and true energy, whatever that looks like. Not exactly pure, just yet true. Because remember, the truth stands alone too. And how can I fully receive this thing? If I don't control this ego, or restrain this ego and allow my body to talk to me when I do hatha yoga. To allow my body to resonate in frequency with the universe when I give my affirmation. Chanting my mantra, whatever that is, whatever language it's in, whatever that intent is. So in order for me to connect higher to the ethers, there's certain things I just got to do as a human. I have to learn how to have focus and concentration and this discriminative discernment surely helps. Where do these things develop? How do I develop them? You know, truth be told, that's the Raja Yoga answer. But right now we're at the Ajna Chakra, the third eye chakra. How can I see with my third eye if I'm wearing these ego glasses? How can the universe talk back to me if my glasses are foggy with the ego fuck shit? that I got to deal with when I'm living in the world of Maya. How do I pierce that veil? How does it work? And that's where Yana Yoga comes in. Now, before I explain what yana yoga is, especially from my perspective, I need to read these things to you. 
Now, remember, I told you about me connecting with this first book, the Sri Vigyana Bhairava Tantra, The Ascent by Swami Satyanan, ooh, Satya, uh, ooh. Hey, I like his name. Swami Satyagananda Saraswati. Yeah, I got it, y'all. That's his full name. He's from the Bihar school. <clears throat> the Bihar school is tough as nails, boo. And I mean, like, they're high-level stuff, okay? They're, like, really up there on the echelon of, of yoga books to, to follow on their commentary and their translation and all that good stuff. Yeah, man, I'm telling you. And this guy didn't have no scandal either. You ain't got to worry about that. All right? Now, Osho, he's a different character. Osho liked the cuss. I don't know if Osho fucked, but he sure sat in the chair a lot and, and talked that talk like I like to hear it. Um, Osho was very big on meditation, as he should be, um, because uh, all of this shit is Tantra. Anyway, so yeah, I'm going to start uh, with the Book of Secrets by Osho. And this is page three, and we are going to talk about Tantra right now, okay? I'm going to let you know how that blends into Yana Yoga. And then we'll get into that other thing. But um, this is a, a long read. So once again, I hope my voice is pretty good. I got my water on hand. You might hear me sip some. Okay. And this is the very start of um, this book. Uh, not the introduction, but chapter one, The World of Tantra. Okay. Here's how he starts. I tell you, I love it. I tell you, I love it. Some introductory points. First, the world of Vigyan, Bhairav, Tantra, the book I just told you about, is not intellectual. It is not philosophical. Doctrine is meaningless to it. It is concerned with method, with technique, not with principles at all. The word Tantra means technique, the method, the path. So it is not philosophical. Note this. It is not concerned with intellectual problems and inquiries it is not concerned with the why of things. It is concerned with how. Not with what is truth, but how truth can be attained. Tantra means technique. So this treatise is a scientific one. Science is not concerned with why. Science is concerned with how. That is the basic difference between philosophy and science. Science asks, how this existence? The moment you ask the question, how? Method, technique become important. Theories become meaningless. Experience becomes the center. Tantra is science. Tantra is not philosophy. To understand philosophy is easy because only your intellect is required. And some of you don't have much of that anyway, but let's continue. If you can understand language, if you can understand concept, another crazy thing that people are losing sight on, you can understand philosophy. You need not change. You require no transformation. As you are, you can understand philosophy, but not Tantra. You will need change, rather a mutation. Unless you are different, Tantra cannot be understood because Tantra is not an intellectual proposition. 
It is an experience. Unless you are receptive, ready, vulnerable to the experience, it is not going to come to you. Let me explain that for one second, especially that last line. Vulnerable to the experience. I have not really talked to you guys about surrender. I may have mentioned it once or twice in other videos. Surrender is not a bad thing. Surrender is a good thing. But more than anything, surrender is a choice. Are we clear? To be vulnerable to an experience is to give permission to that experience. Which is why if you are performing the sexual aspects of Tantra, it is not recommended for you to do so if you have been raped, molested, been in an incestual relationship or have had any sexual or physical trauma because you are not vulnerable to the experience as far as giving it any permission. You have not given that experience permission. So you were not vulnerable to it and you were not ready nor receptive to it. Someone may have coached you, but you did not make a choice. Know that surrender is a choice. And it is important in Tantra, in yoga, no matter what type of yoga it is, surrender is important. Most people do not understand what surrender is. You think it's a bad thing. It is not. That's how most truths work. Beings will manipulate you into believing that certain truths are actually bad and or false, not realizing that that is where you should be. But here you are. And let's go back to the book. I'm still on page three. I'm going from page three to page six, Wody. Philosophy is concerned with the mind. Your head is enough. Your totality is not required. Tantra needs you in your totality. It is a deeper challenge. You will have to be in it wholly. It is not fragmentary. A different approach, a different attitude, a different mind to receive it is required. Because of this, Devi, the goddess, is asking apparently philosophical questions. Tantra starts with Devi's questions. If you notice, I've told you, Tantra is a conversation between Shiva and Shakti, Devi, Devi, goddess, and Deva, God. Feminine and masculine. All questions can be tackled philosophically. I'm going back to the book, y'all. Really, any question can be tackled in two ways, philosophically or totally, intellectually or ex existentially. For example, if someone asks, what is love? You can tackle it intellectually, you can discuss, you can propose theories, you can argue for a particular hypothesis, you can create a system, a doctrine, and you may not have known love at all. To create a doctrine, experience is not needed. Really, on the contrary, the less you know, the better, because then you can propose a system unhesitatingly. Only a blind man can easily define what light is. 
When you do not know, you are bold. Ignorance is always bold. Knowledge hesitates. And the more you know, the more you feel that the ground underneath is dissolving. The more you know, the more you feel how ignorant you are. And those who are really wise, they become ignorant. They become as simple as children or as simple as idiots. The less you know, the better. To be philosophical, to be dogmatic, to be a doctrinaire, this is easy. To tackle a problem intellectually is very easy. But to tackle a problem existentially, not just to think about it, but to live it through, to go through it, to allow yourself to be transformed through it, is difficult. That is dangerous because you will not remain the same. The experience is going to change you. The moment you enter love, you enter a different person. And when you come out, you will not be able to recognize your old face. It will not belong to you. A discontinuity will have happened. Now there is a gap. The old man is dead and the new man has come. This is what is known as rebirth, being twice born. Tantra is non-philosophical and existential. So of course, Devi asks questions which appear to be philosophical, but Shiva is not going to answer them that way. So it is better to understand it in the beginning. Otherwise, you will be puzzled because Shiva is not going to answer a single question. All the questions that Devi is asking, Shiva is not going to answer at all. And he still answers. And really, only he has answered them and no one else, but on a different plane. Devi asks, what is your reality, my Lord? He is not going to answer it. On the contrary, he will give a technique. And if Devi goes through this technique, she will know. So the answer is roundabout. It is not direct. He is not going to answer, who am I? Which is yana yoga. He will give you a technique. Do it and you will know. I'm going to uh, sidestep a little bit here because I got a whole lot more reading to do, y'all. And I'm going to um, reiterate a story that I may have told once or twice already. Definitely once, but I'll tell it again. My Guru Dev, uh, Sri, Sri Swami Sachinananda, when he first came to America, encountered hippies. Okay? They took LSD. They smoked weed. They did this. They were fucking all over the place. All kinds of shit, right? And they would come to him and say, I'm an alcoholic. What do I do? I'm a druggie. What do I do? I have this issue. What do I do? I have that issue. What do I do? And Guru Dev would never say, stop doing what, you, what you're doing. He would never say, uh, go to rehab and, and, and stop doing those drugs. He would never say, stop cheating on your wife. And, 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 and you know, things like this. What he would say was, go do some yoga. Do your yoga. Do your yoga. And that is Tantra. Because I guarantee you, some of these people are still living today. And they tell me, I stopped doing my junk. Not because of him, but because I did yoga. 
and I just stopped doing, there were certain things that they did that were specifically for whatever they got going on, but whatever, they just kept doing their yoga. When you stop being consistent in your practice, guess what? All the shit comes back. But do your yoga is tantra. Do. Don't talk about it. Do it. That is tantra. Okay? All right. Let's go back. Oh. And I just told you that, and look what the next sentence says. For Tantra, doing is knowing, and there is no other knowing. Unless you do something, unless you change, unless you have a different perspective to look at, to look with, unless you move in an altogether different direction than the intellect, there is no answer. Answers can be given. They are all lies. All philosophies are lies. This is important for Yana Yoga, okay? Y'all remember that. I'm going to try to keep a little piece of paper right here so I can remember that so we can go back to that when I really explain Yana Yoga to y'all. But I got to keep reading, babies. I got to keep reading. You ask a question and the philosophy gives you an answer. It satisfies you or it doesn't satisfy you. If it satisfies you, you become a convert to the philosophy, but you remain the same. If it doesn't satisfy you, you go on searching for some other philosophy to be converted to, but you remain the same. You are not touched at all. You are not changed. So whether you are a Hindu or a Mohammedan or a Christian or a Jain, it makes no difference. The real person behind the facade of a Hindu or a Mohammedan or a Christian is the same. Only words differ or clothes. The man who is going to the church or to the temple or to the mosque is the same man. Only faces differ and they are faces which are false. They are masks. Behind the masks, you will see the same man, the same anger, the same aggression, the same violence, the same greed, the same lust, everything the same. Is the Mohammedan sexually different from Hindu sexuality? Is Christian violence different from Hindu violence? It is the same. The reality remains the same. Only clothes differ. And I'm going to add only language differs. Tantra is not concerned with your clothes. Tantra is concerned with you. If you ask a question, it shows where you are. It shows also that wherever you are, you cannot see. That is why there is the question. A blind man asks, what is light? And philosophy will start answering, what is light? Tantra will only know this. If a man is asking, what is light? It only shows that he is blind. Tantra will start operating on the man, changing the man so that he can see. The question is, see what? <laughs> what kind of light does he see? Tantra will not say what is light. Uh -huh. Tantra will tell you how to attain insight, how to attain seeing, how to attain vision. When the vision is there, the answer will be there. Tantra will not give you the answer. Tantra will give you the technique to attain the answer. So in essence, everything is Tantra if you look at, at it as a technique. Something to do. Now this answer is not going to be intellectual. And this is the book again, not me, okay? If you say something about light to a blind man, this is intellectual. 
If the blind man himself becomes capable of seeing, this is es existential. This is what I mean to say, this is what I mean when I say that Tantra is existential. So Shiva is not going to answer Devi's questions. Devi and Shakti, same thing, okay? Still, he will answer the first thing. The second thing, this is a different type of language. You must know something about it before we enter into it. All the Tantra treaties are dialogues between Shiva and Devi, AKA Shakti. Devi questions and Shiva answers. All the Tantra treaties start that way. Why? Why this method? It is very significant. It is not a dialogue between a teacher and a disciple. It is a dialogue between two lovers. And Tantra signifies through it a very meaningful thing that the deeper teachings cannot be given unless there is a love between the two, the disciple and the master. Bhakti yoga, folks. The disciple and master must become deep lovers and don't think it's in a sexual way either. Stop that fuckery. Only then can the higher, the beyond be expressed. When they talk about deep lovers, they mean deep in a mutual love and respect. Okay? When it's pure like that, you have a love and a reverence and a respect for your guru and they have the same for you because, you know, you probably evolved into something super great on your own. Or there's just a natural spiritual connection there without anything based in the ego, which would be in the Maya and the illusion, which would be like, excuse me, physical sex and all this other crap that you fall into when it comes to um, sex based on Tantra or any sort of elevation based in the physical aspect of sex, because you were supposed to leave that back there with the other types of yoga, right? See, it doesn't make sense to jump to the Ajna chakra when your second chakra, which deals with sex and creativity and all that, isn't purified and ready to ascend to the higher levels past physical. Then you crash and burn and burn yourself up and burn yourself out. When you learn how to be with yourself, and be comfortable in yourself and know yourself and have that love for your and respect for yourself, whether it be through uh, the postures or through karma yoga or through uh, bhakti yoga or japa yoga. It's important when you reach that, uh, that third chakra, right? Um, that you have this open, open dialogue with the universe, okay? Yeah, there you go. Let's go back to the book, shall we? So it is a language of love. The disciple must be in an attitude of love. But not only this, because friends can be lovers, Tantra says a disciple moves as receptivity. So the disciple must be in a feminine receptivity. Only then is something possible. You need not be a woman to be a disciple, but you need to be in a feminine attitude of receptivity. AKA surrender, bitches. Um, when Davy asks, it means the feminine attitude asks. Why this emphasis on the feminine attitude? Men and women are not only physically different, they are psychologically different. 
Sex is not only a difference in the body, it is a difference in psychologies also. A feminine mind means receptivity, total receptivity, surrender, love. A disciple needs a feminine psychology. Otherwise, he will not be able to learn. You can ask, but if you are not open, then you cannot be answered. You can ask a question and still remain closed. Then the answer cannot penetrate you. Your doors are closed. You are dead and you are not open. A feminine receptivity means a womb-like receptivity in the inner depth so that you can receive. And not only that, much more is implied. A woman is not only receiving something, the moment she receives it, it becomes a part of her body. A child is received. A woman conceives. The moment there is conception, the child has become part of the feminine body. It is not alien. It is not foreign. It has been absorbed. Now the child will live not as something added to the mother, but just as a part, just as the mother. And the child is not only received, the feminine body becomes creative and the child begins to grow. Where's your second chakra, ladies? It's in your womb. Yes, babies. Yes. Back to the book, y'all. We on page five, so we almost done here with this, okay? A disciple needs a womb-like receptivity. Whatsoever is received is not to be gathered as dead knowledge. It must grow in you. It must become blood and bones in you. It must become a part. Now, it must grow. This growth will change you, will transform you, the receiver. That is why Tantra uses this device. Every treaty starts with Devi asking a question and Shiva replying to it. Devi is Shiva's consort, his feminine part. One thing more. Now, modern psychology, this is still the book, y'all, depth psychology particularly, says that man is both man and woman. No one is just male and no one is just female. Everyone is bisexual. Both sexes are there. This is a very recent research in the West, but for Tantra, this has been one of the most basic concepts for thousands of years. You must have seen some pictures of Shiva as Arnaneshwar. Arna and it's really Arnaneshwara. Half man, half woman. There is no other concept like it in the whole history of man. Shiva is depicted as half man, half woman. So Devi is not just a consort. She is Shiva's other half. And unless a disciple becomes the other half of the master, it is impossible to convey the higher teachings, the esoteric methods. When you become one, then there is no doubt. When you are one with the master, so totally one, so deeply one, there is no argument, no logic, no reason. One simply absorbs. One becomes a womb. 
And then the teachings begin to grow in you and change you. That is why Tantra is written in love language. Something must also be understood about love language. There are two types of language, logical language and love language. There are basic differences between the two. Logical language is aggressive, argumentative, violent. If I use logical language, I become aggressive upon your mind. I try to convince you, to convert you, to make a puppet of you. My argument is right and you are wrong. Logical language is egocentric. I am right and you are wrong. So I must prove that I am right and you are wrong. I am not concerned with you. I am concerned with my ego. My ego is always right. Love language is totally different. I am not concerned with my ego. I am concerned with you. I am not concerned to prove something, to strengthen my ego. I am concerned to help you. It is a compassion to help you grow, to help you transform, to help you to be reborn. Secondly, logic will always be intellectual. Concepts and principles will be significant. Arguments will be significant. With love language, what is said is not so significant. Rather, it is the way it is said. The container, the word is not important. The content, the message is more important. It is a heart to heart talk, not a mind to mind discussion. It is not a debate, it is a communion. So this is rare. Devi is sitting in the lap of Shiva and asking and Shiva answers. It is a love dialogue, no conflict as if Shiva is speaking to himself. But a lot of us don't even speak to ourselves with a love language, which is why you go through all them other chakras and all them other yogas and all them other shits to learn how to love yourself. So when you have that love language with yourself, it's easier to have that love language with the universe. Baby K. Let's continue. Why this emphasis on love, love language? Because if you are in love with your master, then the whole gestalt changes. It becomes different. Then you are not hearing his words. Then you are drinking him. Then the words are irrelevant, really. The silence between the words becomes more significant while we practice mauna. What he is saying may be meaningful or it may not be meaningful, but it is his eyes, his gestures, his compassion, his love. That is why Tantra is a fixed device, a structure. Every treaty starts with Devi asking and Shiva answering. No argument is going to be there. No wastage of words. There are simple statements of fact, telegraphic messages with no view to convince, just to relate. If you encounter Shiva with a question, with a closed mind, he will not answer you in this way. First, your closeness has to be broken. Then he will have to be aggressive. Then your prejudices, then your preconceptions have to be destroyed. Unless you are cleared completely of your past, nothing can be given to you. 
But this is not so with his consort Davy. With Davy, there is no past. Remember, when you are so deeply in love, your mind ceases to be. There is no past. Only the present moment. Then I'll talk to you about this present moment business. Only the present moment becomes everything. When you are in love, the present is the only time. The now is all. No past, no future. So Davy is just open. There is no defense, nothing to be cleared, nothing to be destroyed. The ground is ready. Only a seed has to be dropped. The ground is not only ready, but welcoming, receptive, asking to be impregnated. So all these sayings that we're going to discuss will be telegraphic. They are just sutras. But each sutra, each telegraphic message given by Shiva is worth a Veda, worth a Bible, worth a Quran. Each single sentence can become the base of, of a great scripture. Scriptures are logical. You have to propose, defend, argue. Here, there is no argument, just simply statements of love. I'm going to leave it there because that was the end of what I was going to read from the Book of Secrets. I was going to go into Sri Vigyana Bhairava Tantra so we get into that connection between uh, Tantra and Yana Yoga. But I think this is enough for you to sit with. Okay? This is the reason why we do all these different yogas. Consider yana yoga your test. So the universe knows to connect with you, to open that seventh chakra, that 10,000 petal lo uh, lotus that brings you to enlightenment. Because that's where y'all want to get to, right? This is what being conscious and woke is all about, right? No, you're not ready for what being truly woke is about. You only want to get to that little surface level where your ego can still do its thing. I've touched the veil where the ego was gone and I hit something beyond that and it scared the living fuck out of me. It scared my ego. Because I wasn't ready to be that womb, that Shakti, that Devi. I'm ready now. Okay? We talking now. But this is it for now. This is like an hour and so. And I already got in trouble with my boyfriend because he tried to text me. And I ain't text his ass back in time. So, you know, I got to make up for that. I got to jump back to real life. All right? I got to prepare and enjoy my life. So, y'all huddle up. Uh, meditate and resonate on that, you know, comment, let me know what you think about what Tantra really is, you know what I'm saying, that shit is hard, that shit ain't easy, and it sure ain't about fucking, god damn, mature man, mature, anyway, bye y'all.